Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Bulletproof Your Business webinar series. We're on to the sixth webinar. Uh, today, we'll be covering backups and disaster recovery as a service. Uh, you should all know uh, at least the backup side of Eintree very well. It's a stable product that we've offered for more than 12 years. Um, and many of you guys joining us today would, would definitely be utilizing that service. Uh, we're going to touch on backups, but we're going to spend quite a lot of time on disaster recovery. Joining us today is, as usual, is David Lees, Joint CEO of Iontree. We have Stephen Cohen uh, in, uh, in Joburg. And then for the first time in our webinar series, we welcome Byron Robertson, our senior pre-sales tech engineer. He will be doing live demos with us, and uh, I hope you guys enjoy it today. David, over to you. Thanks, Jaco. Can you move on to the next slide? Okay, so uh, I know we in this lockdown, I kind of get up in the morning and I feel like it's Groundhog Day. And probably if you've watched all of our seminars, this will sound like Groundhog Day, but just for the benefit of those of you who haven't and for the future um, uses of these, these um, webinar videos, uh, what you're looking at here is really a depiction of, of how Iron Tree operates and the elements that you see in the cloud are all, all elements that we use in our business to make sure that we are, uh, we have great business continuity. We, we're not really affected by disruptive events in whatever format that is, whether it's a theft or a fire or a flood or a um, data corruption uh, or, a, or a COVID lockdown period. We, we don't really suffer any um, uh, continuity based effects. Our business carries on. Now we also understand that a lot of you watching might not need all of the elements in the cloud. Um, and uh, so, so I leave it up to you guys to figure out which ones are relevant for you. A lot of you are using some of these elements. I hope that most of you are using some kind of backup service. In fact, probably are because I, I think Yoko, most of the people who invited to these webinars are existing Iron Tree customers. Um, and maybe some of you are using Office 365, but probably not Teams. And you might be using some of the other elements, but uh, nevertheless, um, these are all elements that we not only use, but we also uh, um, service and support. Um, today's uh, webinar is, as Yaka said, the backup and uh, disaster recovery. And I'm just going to hand straight over to Stephen and Byron to conduct this webinar, and uh, then we'll speak again at the end. Over to you, Steve. <clears throat> okay, good morning, everyone. Um, just to quickly go over you know, what Auntie's been doing for the last 13, 14 years. Back up in the cloud. Um, and obviously that implies a few things. Rapid recovery, you've got to be able to get your data back quickly. It's fully supported. We take about 6,000 calls a month, which I'm quite proud of, of people who don't need help, but want help. And I think there's a difference. And uh, there are probably about... 25 people in our, in our call center, our technical team. And, and, you know, when people are anxious about recovering data, although they could do it on their own, they like having somebody to talk to. Uh, so it's fully supported, fully secure, backs up all the data you select. What's important is that it takes up very little bandwidth. Because if you had 10 units of data to back up, your first unit takes 10, uh, your first backup takes 10 units of, let's say, internet bandwidth. But after that, it just does it on an incremental basis. So there's really nothing, uh, if you added 11 units, it does, sorry, if you added one unit, so now you have 11 units, it doesn't back up the whole 11. It's already got your 10, so it just backs up the changes. And we call that incremental backup technology. We're doing over 17,000 businesses. Uh, they trust us. We've had uh, an interesting disaster about uh, two months ago where a restaurant chain went down, 400 of them. And they recovered from us because they were hit with ransomware, but they were backing up every day. And very quickly, we had them all up and running. So, you know, although it may be a bit of a boring topic, backing up your data, it's like breathing air. You take it for granted, but if somebody takes it away from you, obviously you feel the pain. Um, I'm also very excited to say that uh, we are launching Entry version 2 in about a month's time. It's going to have superb features, extra functionality, beautiful user interface, and we'll obviously have a series of seminars around that when it comes out. But 
It really incorporates the latest cutting edge technology, primarily from a user interface perspective, but also some very funky features that you can add, which actually makes it much more exciting than it used to be. Our free trial continues on our iron tree version two. You'll read all about it, so you can check it out. But we're expecting all 17,000 businesses that use our backup technology to upgrade to iron tree version two within probably about three months after the launch of it. Next Please. slide. Yeah, you know, just quickly interject there. So when building this slide out, I, I wanted to actually emphasize uh, that sentence where it says backs up all data. There was a, obviously when Iantry started, there was a, a big focus on backing up your critical financial data. But uh, over the past few years, we've actually kind of tried to get the message across that Iantry not only backs up that data, but it backs up all data. So, and, and this is something that's going to be really focused on in, in Iantry version two, where you, where your, your data that you have on your computer, all of that data is now able to be backed up. So that's something I really wanted to bring across on this slide. Couldn't have said it better myself. Well done, by, uh, Yaku. I forgot about it. <laughs> In fact, just to add a bit about it, I mean, I was the managing director of Pestle at the time and we launched it as Pestle Backup. And still, so many of the 17,000 businesses, even if they don't use Pestle uh, themselves, let's say they're using RQ or QuickBooks, they still see it as Pestle Backup. So it only backs up your financial data, but it, it doesn't. And it, Yaku, I'm glad you said it. With version two, that will become much more obvious in the user's, uh, in the user's face. All right, so now we move on to disaster recovery. And I, I want to try and keep this very simple. So pretend that on your computer, you have Windows, which is your operating system. You have Word and Excel documents, and you have Pastel. Just for this example, just pretend that those are the applications you're running. So again, Microsoft Windows, let's call it Microsoft Office and Pastel. And pretend that's all you do. In the traditional world of what auntie has been doing for, 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 for over a decade, you would back up your data. So if you, got, if you lost your data, or let's say you lost your computer, Let's rather say that you lost, you lose your computer either through theft, fire, or it blows up. What would you do? You would go and get a new computer. You would reload all your software. And what would all your software be, in my example? Windows, Microsoft Office, and Pastel. And once you've done that, which could take a day or two, you know, people have forgotten where their disks are and downloading from the internet, that whole thing's a mission. And then right at the end, you would Contact Andre if you wanted us to help you, and you would restore your data and you would then carry on. What disaster recovery does is it actually backs up not only your data, but it backs up your programs as well. And in my example, your programs would be Windows, Microsoft Office, and Pastel, and your data. So that's the difference between what we call DRAWS, Disaster Recovery as a Service, and your normal traditional backups. So the obvious question then is, well, why would I backup everything? You know, before it was just my data, and I will still say that your data is critical, the most critical, because programs can be reinstalled. Data can't be reinstalled unless you're backing it up. So the two points at the bottom, really give rise to why the term draws came about probably a year and a half, two years ago. The one is your recovery point objective and the other one is your recovery time objective. Now your recovery point objective is more related to data, which as I said two minutes ago, is the traditional stuff we've always been doing. So when you restore, what's your biggest question all the time is, when last did I back up? Because when I restore, is it last week, a month ago? And you've been through that nightmare, I'm sure, where it's out of date and you then have to recapture all the data from that, that recovery point where you restored from. And what's great about services like Iantry is that it runs scheduled in the background. And what I found human nature is everybody gets it going when it's not an automated service and then they forget to do it 
at least with iron tree, you know it's happening automatically in the background every day. So at the very worst, your recovery point objective should be a day ago. That's in the worst case scenario. Draws, the disaster recovery as a service more applies to the recovery time objective. So when I spoke about in the old days, if you're just backing up data, you would have to go out by the PC, get Windows loaded, get Office loaded, get Pascal loaded, then you would get the data. Now that would, uh, in a good case scenario, would take you a day. Your recovery time objective is now brought down to minutes withdrawals. Because what we do is we are backing up all your applications, the Office, the Windows and Pascal, and your data to our servers. So if you have a disaster, all you do is log on to our server and carry on working. And then when you've got your computer up and running again and all that stuff, then you will just restore your whole system back to your computer. And that's the vital difference that we're talking about. The one backs up data only, which is very uh, the most important thing. The other one backs up your programs as well. So you don't have to reload your program. You just carry on working. So pretend you have a disaster. Well, actually, I'm not going to go through it because Byron's going to talk to the points that you would go through if you've signed up for Entry's disaster recovery as a service. And because of the world we live in, I think that disaster recovery of a service has come about because people want their recovery time objective to be minutes rather than days. So before you make a decision about whether to go with disaster recovery as a service, which is really your complement to the data recovery as a service, you need to decide what type of business you have. If you're in a business that you need everything up and running all the time, then disaster recovery as a service is very important. If you're in a business, like pretend you're a bookkeeper, and okay, so you'll work a bit harder tonight because you'll catch up your work, but it's not that important that you're operating every minute. You know, then, okay, maybe draws isn't the right thing for you. So you've just got to decide. A, a good example would be banks. Banks have to be up all the time. They can't tell their customers, oh, we're going to reload all our infrastructure and in a week's time we'll come back online. They need draws. And they go to the, to the actual, you know, they take it to the extreme. They actually have secondary offices set up that are unpopulated, but they're there with computers and they just empty in case of a disaster where even their staff can now drive to the other location and carry on working immediately. So really it's up to the kind of urgency in your business to get up and going in minutes instead of days or hours. Next slide. All right, so how does draws work? Pretend you've, got, you've had a disaster, you're with Aunty. What do you do? You call Aunty and confirm the disaster. Okay, so you phone an Aunty consultant, listen, I've just had theft, all my computers are stolen, but I've been using your draw service. Aunty then mounts your virtual machine infrastructure. Essentially what that means is we backed up your whole system and we now make it live. We then co connect you to a pre-configured virtual private network. So you just get an internet IP that you connect to. You log on to your server at our data center at Vodacom and you continue working. And honestly, if, you had, if your last backup had run five minutes ago, you would almost continue working like nothing ever happened. And then after the disaster, once you've got all your stuff sorted out in your office, you then do another system failover back to your local infrastructure. I must tell you this is an interesting point because what we have found is that some people work in the kind of, let's call it the disaster scenario where they're working from the server at, uh, at the Vodacom data center and they actually decide never to fail back because they say, you know, this works so well, I'm happy. And what, that, what then ends up happening if you've listened to the previous lecture is that you're then working in a hosted environment. And, you know, we've been telling clients in the last lectures, you know, what, why hosted environments are so uh, beneficial and convenient. It's quite ironic that in a disaster situation, you are then working in a hosted environment. And, and, and I'll tell you, 80% of the clients decide to actually stay there. And they just say, this is so convenient. We can work wherever, you know, whenever we want to. And they just stay in that environment. Next slide. 
Okay, so this is over to our technical guru. Byron's going to take us through how this thing looks and works. Thanks. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, how's it, everyone? Thanks for joining us today. Um, some of you may know me. My name's Byron, as they've mentioned already. I'm one of the, the sales guys at IronTree. Uh, today, we're going to be going over one of our disaster recovery products. Um, in this case, it is Rubric. Um, Rubric is, we, we look at Rubric as our, our flagship disaster recovery product. Um, but further than that, uh, what does Rubric do for us? Uh, so on top of backups and disaster recovery, um, there's some cool features and benefits of using the solution as well. Um, single single file and folder backup if necessary. I've obviously we want to use the system for a full system backup. In terms of recovery, recovery is extremely powerful. I'm going to actually take you take you guys through a live demo after this. Um, over there we've got a point that says instant recovery and it's it's probably the closest thing we're going to get to a instant recovery. Replication. Replication will be to a second location. Um, so from your local environment to your client's environment to a second site, which in most cases would be the Eintree data center. And that way we can achieve a offsite disaster recovery solution. Search, I'll give you an example of that during the demonstration. Archiving, uh, Rubrica is really integrated well into the archiving space uh, when it comes to, to backups. Um, we're actually able to archive to any of the public cloud providers uh, using the Rubrica solutions. So that's Azure, Amazon, and Google Cloud. Um, and then just general compliance, uh, compliance in terms of your backups and your disaster recovery um, needs. So we, we see Rubrica really as a single software platform or a single pane of glass into your backup and disaster recovery environment. It's a very powerful uh, solution. I'm going to give you guys a quick demo of just how powerful it can be for you. Do you want to go over, Yaku? Okay, so just to go over what we're going to demonstrate, um, I'm going to show you the, the console. Uh, we're then going to see how we would apply protection to the console or to an unprotected server, rather. Um, and then we're going to run some restores. So we'll run a single file and folder restore. <coughs> and then we'll actually perform a full server failover as well. So you guys should be able to see my screen. So this is the Rubric console. Uh, you can see that it's a online environment or online cloud portal. This is our demo environment specifically. And I'm going to be taking you over the dashboard here. Um, so you've got your typical widgets. This is your overview of what's happening in the backup environment. Very interesting point to mention here is the local data reduction. So what Rubrik does very, very well is its data deduplication and compression with the backups. So a nice use case or a nice example of that, if you have a, a server environment with multiple servers and those servers are all running the same operating system. Rubrik is intelligent enough to only keep one backup of the latest operating system in the backup repository. So that then turns out to be a direct cost saving for the end user because Rubrik isn't backing up every single operating system, it's only backing up the most recent one, which obviously takes up less storage and then you get billed less because it's based on storage. Very powerful. 70% um, local data reduction. You can see here we've got 396 snapshots in the environment. A snapshot in Rubrics world is a backup. Towards the bottom here, you can see that um, I've got a vSphere VM. Uh, this is my vSphere environment. This is my demo environment. And just by looking at this block here, I can see that I have two virtual machines in this environment. One of them is protected and one of them has no SLA. So no SLA means that that server is unprotected. Rubrik uses SLA domains to apply protection to unprotected virtual machines. It's their sort of uh, backup engine or backup brains, the powerhouse behind the configuration of the backups. We're gonna go over SLA domains shortly, um, but you can see here in the middle at the bottom, we've got an overview of my various SLA domains in my environment. 
Okay, so let's go to SLA domains and I will show you exactly what sort of parameters we have to play around with here. Uh, just clicking on the left through to local domains, I'll get a list of all of my SLA domains. I'm going to go to the iEntry demo and I'm going to edit this field. And what you see up on the screen here is essentially what happens when we create an SLA domain or SLA policy to protect a virtual machine or a physical machine. So we start off with a simple naming convention. Um, most of our clients use this naming convention to categorize what servers they protected. So if they have a server farm of accounting servers, they'll create an SLA domain <coughs> just for those accounting servers. Um, same with production. You can create multiple SLA domains, starting off simply name, name that SLA domain according to what you see fit. You could even categorize that into the uh, priority clients. So your priority clients could get a gold SLA, just like a normal SLA agreement. They could get a gold SLA, uh, mid-tier guys could get silver, and so on. Towards the middle of the screen here, we've got two sides, essentially. We've got take snapshots and keep snapshots. So this goes back to Stephen's point earlier in the presentation about the recovery point objective. So take snapshots is essentially us creating our recovery point objectives. We tell in rubric how often we want to back up to the cloud. So you can see here, my first parameter is every hour. So every single hour, I want to take a backup. Now on the right hand side, we've got keep snapshots. So I want to keep those hourly backups for three days. So essentially going back three days, I'm going to have hourly iterations of my virtual server. Over here, the next line down, every one day I want to take an image or backup of the server. And I want to keep a daily backup or a daily version of my server for 31 days. And so it goes on and on. Towards the bottom here, you can see that our local retention has been set to five years. So essentially I could go back five years and pull up an image of my servers from five years ago. So these are the parameters that we use to, to apply protection to virtual machines. This on the left hand side is essentially us creating the <coughs> uh, recovery point objective. So now that I've created the SLA policy, I want to now apply that to an unprotected virtual machine. So going back to the dashboard here, we can see that uh, bottom left, I've got one server with no uh, SLA. So this is hyperlinked, I can click through to that. I can see the server that's unprotected, the location of it, and here I can see there's no SLA. So essentially to apply protection to a virtual machine, I would highlight the virtual machine, I would say manage protection, <coughs> excuse me. Um, <coughs> Then I'll select the iEntry demo SLA policy and I'll submit that. And that will essentially now apply a SLA policy or protection to that virtual machine. Now, to take it a step back a, a little bit, um, how did some of you may be thinking how Rubrik found that virtual machine? So, Rubrik integrates at the hypervisor level. So, essentially, you put down a Rubrik. Um, appliance, in this case, it's called a Rubrik Cube. That Rubrik Cube then plugs into your hypervisor or your network. And from that, we start auto discovering uh, virtual machines or servers in your environment. And from that, we can then apply SLA policies to them. Okay, so I'm going to now show you what a protected server looks like. So I could go from the dashboard here, or I could drop down my virtual machines there, and then click through to vSphere VMs. <coughs> so you can see that I've got two servers here, the ABC group that we've just applied protection to, and then Transactive LLC. So I'm gonna click through to that. So once I've clicked through to that, I'm presented with, Quite a nice overview window of exactly what's happening 
uh, with the backups and recovery for this exact server, Transactive LLC. So on the left-hand side, I've got a standard overview. I can see what SLA policy has been applied there. I can see my latest snapshot, total snapshot. Total snapshots is essentially how many backups have taken place for the server. And my next scheduled snapshot, normal overview. On the right-hand side over here, I've got a very nice calendar overview of the backups that have taken place. So each one of these dots here represents a backup that's taken place in my environment. <clears throat> you can see according to my SLA policy, which is the iEntry demo one, if I click into this, I'm going to have hourly iterations of my, my server. That's according to that policy we've set up. And then going back to March, I've got various versions I can restore from. Any of these restore points here could be a single file of folder restore or an entire server failover, which I'll show you shortly. Then going back to February, I've got my monthly image for the month of Feb. What you can see at the top um, of the snapshots field here is a search field. <clears throat> so it says here, search my file name. So on my, on my server, I've got a folder on my desktop and that folder is called Consolidated Sales Sheet. So what Rubrik allows me to do, which is extremely powerful, is search across all of my backups. So no matter where my backups are residing, I can search through those backups through the Rubrik console um, and start looking for data. So <coughs> Sorry. If my data is sitting with iEntry, if it's sitting locally, or if, if, if it's sitting in one of the public clouds, I'm able to search for the file name. I'm going to do that here. I know that on my desktop, I've got a, a sales sheet. So I'm going to search for it and then let's see what happens. Okay, so you can see that searching for consolidated, it's brought back some results. So the one that we are interested in is the sales sheet that is sitting <coughs> on my. So you can see that Rubrik has actually found 119 versions of my consolidated sales sheet. So that means that Rubrik has now looked through every single backup location it's looked through local backups, it's looked through backups with iEntry, and it's looked through my archives that are sitting with Azure. And it's found 119 various versions that I can restore from. And this is just for my single sales sheet. So I can click on that, and I can choose any one of these as my restore point. But let me show you the server first. So I'm going to jump into my VM environment. This is my demo environment as well. You can see that transactive server we're protecting with Rubrik. Allow me to connect to the server just so I can show you where that data is. Then I'm going to show you what it's like to restore single files and folders. Okay, so on my desktop here, you can see that consolidated sales sheet. Now let's, let's imagine that this sales sheet has been corrupted and I now need to restore that sales sheet. So I'm going to go to, I'm going to restore rather that sales sheet to my C drive. On my C drive, I've got a restore folder and that restore folder is currently empty. So now we know that that sales sheet is corrupted. I need to restore the data back to this environment. So I'm going to go over to rubric. I'm going to determine which is my um, most logical restore uh, or, or timestamp, my recovery point to, to restore from. And I'm going to choose it and I'm going to say restore. Then I'm going to restore to a separate folder path. So that folder path is the folder path that you saw earlier, that restore folder on my C drive. And I'm going to say continue. Now Rubrik is going to go fetch that um, that version wherever it's sitting in any one of those backup locations I mentioned. 
It's then going to restore it back to my, my virtual machine. We can click on the globe here. It gives us an activity overview of, of what's happening. You can see that I've got two, uh, pro, uh, two tasks in progress over there. That just tells me that something's happening in my environment. Again, in, in a couple of seconds, that folder is going to restore um, to the server. What I can show you in the meantime as well, if I go back to that transactive server, if we, if we don't want to search for a file like that, I, I can use one of these, one of these uh, backups that have taken place to restore data. And let me show you what that looks like. So I'm going to click on Wednesday over here. Um, I can... <clears throat> I can then go to one of these restore points here. And then if I say recover files, we essentially achieve the same thing. However, this allows, doing it this way allows me to dive into the C drive and then also select multiple sets of data to restore back to the original location. That restore can be either to my local machine as I'm sitting here in Joburg now, I can restore data here or I can restore it back to the, the server itself. So that's another way that Rubik allows you to restore files and folders. Let's just have a look here to see if this is done. What do you love live demos? Steve, do you want to add anything while we wait for this folder to appear? Sorry, Byron, my, my microphone was just off. Yeah, you know, I, while you were doing it, I was just thinking to myself that a lot of the features that you're showing now, um, well, not the virtual machine stuff, but you know, the way you set up your SLA, uh, I yeah. want everybody to look forward to the fact that all of that functionality exists in uh, Aintree version 2. Yeah. Where you will have a lot more control over when you back up, how often, how often your backups are kept for, um, which obviously can create confusion, but we will set up default plans like backup Perfect. every day. To keep your weekly backup for a month, keep your monthly backup for a year. So to just have more clearly defined, let's say, backup sets if you yeah. need to get to stuff. And, and also, you know, the search for files and folders. People need to understand that you don't have to restore an entire backup. You can just say, you know, I screwed up an Excel spreadsheet and uh, the one from two months ago is the right one. You can just restore that file and not to... The original location, you can restore it to That's your local. And, and, and I just want people to know that this interface and the functionality, excluding obviously all the virtual servers that you show, will exist in Aintree version 2. So I'm just trying to get everybody to be into it. <laughs> no, for sure. Um, yeah, I think what Rubik's done well here as well as, well as uh, mentioning, mentioning Aintree version 2. The interface is really straightforward. Um, <clears throat> you don't need to be technical at all to understand what you do. And I think if you just think about things logically, you'll get quite far in one of these, these sort of consoles, which is great. Let's see if I, that's... I can, I, can I make a comment as well? Yes. So I think what's, what's also quite important to state is that the Pinetree Disaster Recovery as a Service solution includes quarterly simulation. So 
We don't yeah. only set this up in case you have a disruptive or disaster, a disruptive event or disaster. We actually do a quarterly simulation. Every quarter, we actually do a full simulation of a disaster. And we can do that because of this infrastructure and the software that we have in place. Without affecting your live environment, we can run a complete simulation. And to, to do that, we also use a tool called Plan for Continuity, which we're having a webinar on uh, next Thursday, I think. Um, and we, we do this with you. We run the simulation. We have a full audit trail. We show you what happened. How did we restore your data? Where did it go to? We let you log in and carry on transacting so that you've got that confidence so that, um, you know, Stephen was mentioning earlier, sometimes you do stuff and you put it in place and then you completely forget about it and you hope that it's happened. And when you have a disaster, you, you then realize, well, what do I do? Where, where did I put this in? How does it work? With this service that we're offering you, you don't have to worry about that because you're actually doing it with us every quarter. Sorry, Byron. Yeah. Over. No, that's fine. Thanks for mentioning that, David. Um, you're a very powerful uh, added benefit of, of the disaster recovery solution with Eindry. Um, okay, so we can see that the job has completed here. If I go to the server, you'll see that that, that file has appeared. <clears throat> so I was able to restore that file back to the original location. Um, looking at the activity detail of what happened, it, he has a bit of blurb telling us that the restore took place and the duration was about four minutes, 50 seconds there to restore that folder. Uh, from wherever it was backed up to, back to the original server. But now, where Rubrik really shines through is with the full system failover. So this is now essentially running through a, a process that we would follow or that you or the client would follow if there was a disaster. On site in this, uh, the server is no longer uh, reachable. Could have been a ransomware attack. Um, could have been a hard drive failure, theft. Uh, whatever the disaster was. I'm not going to show you how we can recover from those sorts of disasters. So just looking at the um, environment here, you can see that I've got two servers, my ABC group and my Transactive LLC. So we're going to use Transactive again. Um, let's take it from the top. So I'm in the dashboard. Uh, we've just declared that there's a disaster on site and I now need to perform a, a recovery. So the first thing I need to do is identify the server that's been uh, affected by that. So I'll go to my virtual machines, then my vSphere VMs, go through to Transactive Server. So I've opened up the backup portion um, of Rubrik for Transactive. And now my next thing I need to do, to do is determine which is or what is my recovery point um, objective here. So we know that the backup has been taking place every single hour all day and I'm keeping those hourly iterations for three days. Um, but now what we need to determine is those hourly images are, are healthy backups or healthy restore points for us. So let's say that we, we got into uh, work today or we woke up and started working today um, and we saw that our, our server had been hit with ransomware. Um, problem with ransomware is that it often sits on your server and uh, there's a bit of a dwell time. Um, it just sits there watching it. So that means that my previous backups may also be affected or may also contain that ransomware. So we're going to take it back to Tuesday and I'm going to choose a restore point from Tuesday because I know that that backup uh, or that re restore point is completely safe. So once I'm in Tuesday, I'm going to choose any one of these hours here and I'm going to perform a full server failover. So let's choose the Hoft 8 backup. I'm going to click on the three dots over here on the right. And then I've got multiple options here of recovery. So I'm, I've got mount, I've got instant, uh, instantly recover, export and recover files. So you saw recover files earlier. That's for uh, single sets of data or multiple sets of files and folders or databases back to the server or to my local machine here. Export, I could essentially export uh, the, the image of that server, the VMDK files. <coughs> instantly recover. So instantly recover will essentially uh, get rid of my original environment because we know it's affected, affected, infected rather. Um, 
and replace it with a failed over server. Um, for purposes of the demo, I'm going to choose mount. So mount keep the original or the live environment up and running. And it's essentially just going to fit over a server to uh, fail over the live server to a second server. So let's see what that process looks like. So my mount type, I'm going to mount an entire virtual machine. I'm going to choose a host. Towards the bottom of the screen here, I'm going to option to remove virtual network devices, which is actually a very, very powerful little option there. Obviously, if we've been infected with ransomware, I don't want to recover my server that possibly still has somewhere um, and then attach it to the network again because you could experience the same attack over again. So by removing virtual uh, network devices, you've got that benefit. And obviously, if your networking hasn't been set up um, accordingly, you can, then you can do that in the background as well. I'm going to also choose to power on the virtual machine once it's done. So I'm going to click finish over here. And now Rubrik is going to attempt to fail over that entire server, recreate the server, and then mount it back to the, the virtual environment. So I'll pull up the activity here. Okay, so uh, activity overview over here, we can see that it's currently creating the data store. <clears throat> the data store is essentially the uh, reference to that, that restore point that we chose. We can then see that it's created the virtual machine, transactive LRC, and you can actually see that timestamp. Uh, the, the 7th of April, uh, half past eight. So it's named the server according to the restore point that we chose. Uh, it's then gone ahead and powered on that virtual machine, and then it's mounted that virtual machine. Mounted it means it's appeared in my, my virtual environment. So that whole process, according to this activity detail, took 39 seconds. So if I go over to that virtual environment, I should see a server named Transactive LLC, 4th of the 7th, or 7th of the 4th, at half past eight. So let's minimize that jump over here, and then you can actually see that the entire virtual machine has been failed over. I can click on that virtual machine. You can see that it's now a matter of time, uh, just, just waiting for Windows to boot up. Um, once that's booted up, I can then connect to this virtual machine, make sure that the server is uh, clean of any sort of ransomware, uh, make sure that my data is intact. I'll then attach networking and give my users access to this failed over uh, virtual machine that we've just created. So that entire disaster recovery process from Rubrik's point of view here took about 40 seconds, which is relatively slow for, for Rubrik, um, if, if I'm being honest. Um, but nonetheless, it only took 40 seconds to fail over that server to uh, the point in time that we chose, our restore point. Now what we do is wait for, for Windows to boot up. What we can do is go back to Rubrik here and on the left-hand side, look at live mounts, vSphere VMs. And you can see that that is now appearing in my rubric console as well. So this is another, oh, this gives you another or a better idea as to how um, integrated rubric is into your backup and disaster recovery environments. We've just held the server over and it's appearing in my rubric console as a failed over server. Um, if I had attached networking, I would get the IP address to that server as well, which is quite convenient. So I don't even need to be in this environment at all. Everything can be handled from this rubric console. I can click on the options here for this failed over server. I've got an option to actually just turn that virtual machine off. So if I connect to the IP address, if it was displayed here, I realize that's wrong. I can power off that server, choose another restore point and carry on testing. Or I could just unmount that virtual machine completely. Uh, if I go to the uh, Transactive LLC original server, click through to that overview uh, window here, you can see there that it's telling me that there's currently one live mount um, of the server taking place. So let's see if Windows has finished booting. It has, so I just want to connect to this console. So 
So let's close that one. We're going to be connecting to the new one, and you'll see it's a new one because where it says connect, there we go. That's the name of the failed over server that we just failed over. Now, because it was a full system failover, obviously all my details are going to be the same. So I'm going to log in with the same user account. We're going to let that spin up a bit. And there we go. So you can see my failed over server still has uh, that Sage Evolution that's installed there, <coughs> as well as that consolidated sales sheet um, on my desktop. So we've essentially performed a full server failover in, I'd say, safely a matter of five minutes. I've, fail, I've failed over an entire server. So gone are the days where we have to sign those sort of SLA agreements with clients that uh, guarantee a, a four-hour recovery time objective. Um, it's quite safe to say that you could possibly sign a half an hour uh, SLA agreement with them in terms of disaster recovery, and you'll be quite safe in doing so. Um, does anyone want to add anything to that before I close off? Aaron? Yes. Yeah, I just, you know, I'm just going to say an obvious thing. I don't want people to get lost in the technology. Um, the technology is absolutely superb. And, uh, you know, the way these programmers did this fascinates me. But remember, the overarching thing is you have a disaster. Yeah. You're freaked out in the office. You're running around. You don't know what to do. You phone entry and all that stuff that Byron shows you happens and you carry on working. So. Yeah. You kind of need to think about yourself in that situation. And those are panic situations. I mean, everybody's watching this demo, you know, in the lockdown period where people have got a lot of time. But in a business, when this happens, generally people aren't so calm. And yeah. all this stuff happens. It's set up before. It's pre-configured. So just don't lose sight of the main story. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And I think the, the plan for continuity software that David mentioned earlier that we use for simulations, also makes this entire process um, a lot smoother, a lot easier for, for both parties involved because everyone knows exactly what's happening um, along the way. Yeah. So that's really, really great. Um, but yeah, that concludes it from my side. Um, Yaku, I'll stop sharing now if you want to jump back to the presentation. Cool. Thanks, Byron. Just yeah, so while you're doing that, guys, I, I just wanted to add to what Stephen said. Uh, absolutely, Steve, I agree with you. From a user perspective, you really just need to know that the, the, the technology what, that Byron showed, really, that, that's, that's how it works. But there's two real um, situations here. The one is that you think, well, this looks great and I need it for my business. And you let us do the whole thing. This solution is also available and normally for bigger businesses if you say, well, I've actually got my own uh, on-site environment and I'd like to institute a, a solution like this as well. So we can also set it up that it's a, a, a self-managed solution on your own environment with a failover to us if you need it. Um, Steve, quite an interesting question. And, and Yako, you can just go to the, the next slide as well, or the last slide uh, while I'm talking. Um, well, Steve, there was interesting questions whilst demo, uh, Byron was doing the demo from, from Kate, who says the product seems to be fail safe and foolproof. If one had this package in place, would it still be necessary to have insurance cover for this sort of thing or cyber insurance? I'm, I'm going to ask you to comment on that, Steve. But before you do, just Kate to say that at Iontree, we don't have any cyber insurance. We've, we've insured our, um, our laptops. Um, and we, we've ensured, obviously, a, you know, a normal fire and, and, and theft and damage to our assets. But we don't have any cyber insurance in place. But the other comment I'd like to make on that is what I often make in these webinars is that the world has changed. And, and it, you need new solutions and different solutions in a business today than you needed 10 or 12 or 15 years ago. And... I like to think we, we kind of look at our business and we see where can we gain benefits and where can we jettison costs that we, we've traditionally had that are no longer useful. And uh, I mean, uh, potentially cyber insurance is one of them, potentially not. Um, 
But if you've got desktops or laptops in your environments and you've got local data on those machines and you haven't put it into the cloud or you're not in a DRAS environment, maybe you still need to look at cyber insurance. Do you, do you need to add anything to that, Steve? No, Dave. I mean, you know, obviously, just to, to educate me, what do you call cyber insurance? Like, what, what, what does that cover? Because I'm thinking loss of profits and all that kind of stuff as well due to this type of scenario. Yeah, I would assume it would cover that kind of stuff, uh, Kate, if you want to add to your question. But I would assume it would be data reinstatement and, um, and that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I, I suppose mean, also, also reputational damage. If you got hit by ransomware and uh, somehow there was reputational damage to the company, I mean, you might still need insurance for that. Yeah, Dave, I agree with you. Okay. I don't have anything more to add. Okay. Um, all right. So I think we, we kind of at the end of this webinar, unless there are other questions or comments, and Jokos put a poll up, which, I'd, which would be great if you all respond to. And just for me to finish off, um, I think, yeah, we've said all we need to say about the disaster recovery. Um, our next webinar, which is on Tuesday, is Voice Over RP Telephony, and I think that's going to be a really interesting one. Um, I encourage you all to attend that one. Um, that's a solution which you use and we use, and it's going to be presented by our partners, uh, Euphoria Telecom, who actually run our Voice Over RP uh, solution. Uh, Yako, back to you. All right, cool. Thanks, guys. Um, I see the poll is live, uh, people are voting. Um, so please uh, cast your vote before you sign off. Um, Byron, thank you very much for, for your attendance today. Steve, great as always, and David, thank you very much for your, for your ever calming influence on these webinars, really appreciate it. All right, guys, um, please enjoy the, the long weekend um, as best you can at home. Um, and yeah, stay safe and then we'll reconvene on on Tuesday morning for the Voice of IP uh, webinar. Thank you very much for joining. Appreciate it. Cheers, guys. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.